Field album, yes, yeah. which was I was like a teenager, and a friend of mine gave me a CD, and I was like, "Man, and that was 1992." Yeah, exactly. That's re really, you know, back then we, we just got independent Slovenia. So if if you got a CD, a jazz CD from someone, it was really like, "Man, I, I better listen to this." <laughs> it was oh, not so much accessible music, so I love that one. So, so I'm thanks, glad. Thanks for taking the time. And, uh, you know, I, I want to ask you in the beginning something. Uh, I'm a music teacher as well and a guitar teacher, and I have a music school here in my hometown. And uh, you wrote this book now, Hip Guitar Lines. Yeah. And, you know, you, you've been involved in education also for a long time. And uh, I just wanted to ask you first, like, what is the idea behind this book and how come you decided to do it? Because I actually saw, like, for guitarists, it's also tabs in it, which, you know, for many of of my students also it's really helpful for various purposes so yeah yeah well i mean the hip guitar lines book um really uh originated out of my own study of trying to increase my vocabulary trying to add in some new things and trying to you know i, I discovered that i would practice but a lot of what i would practice i would forget the next day you know i would just move and i would be on to something else and it would be okay i mean i would I would still be getting better, but I would be like, what was that thing I worked on two days ago that I really liked and I had no idea. So I began to write things down and catalog that. And I uh, had a student who's the, the, the person who wrote the book with me, Jim Martin, who uh, was taking lessons and I, I would always play stuff before a lesson and say, check this out and check this out. He said, well, let me write all that down. So he began to write down everything I would would say, here's what I'm working on now. And so over the course of a year or two, he wrote down a lot of the stuff I was working on. And that became the hip guitar lines book. I realized that what I was doing was writing for myself, my own syllabus, my own, um, uh, I guess, thesaurus of scales or pad. I was writing my own sort of how I'm working and stuff. Right. And he, he, you know, he and I both thought, you know, wow, I bet that would have a value for someone else to look at as like a, you know, as root material, like you could look at that and then build, get some ideas, see how it's put together and then come up with your own type of things. Yeah. And uh, his, the tab was his idea. He, he teaches uh, students that are much younger than me. You know, he teaches high school students and, and he's like, you know, a lot of them are better reading tab than they are at notes. Yeah. You know? And I was like, really? I, I, cause I don't even, I don't even read tab. I don't even know. I can't even read it. I'll tell you the truth. I don't. I mean, I can, I can figure it. I can read it slowly. Ideas, I don't yeah. read it like you know. I can read the notes though. And he was like, "No, no, no. It'll be a, it'll be important to do that for for students that aren't as advanced." I was like, "Okay." So he he did that, and uh, he did an amazing job. He did a really fantastic job, and I think it's increased the the benefit of the book to a lot more people. Yeah, definitely. I mean, it helps, like especially for someone who's a beginner. And wants to like dive into this basic language you know many of them come from rock from my experience and they don't know how to read music you know so then it's like okay i want to play jazz so this is really i think a cool idea to do it like that also it's approachable okay. for them thank you i'll let him know that you said that you yeah know. like <laughs> approval right <laughs> but but uh, uh regarding teaching and learning jazz i, I wanted to ask you you know, you, you were born in 1956, if I'm not mistaken, and that's right. That means growing up, like in, I guess, early 70s, finding out about jazz. How did you stumble upon that, and what was your process in the beginning? I mean, uh, my was like, you know, we had CDs and cassettes. I was transcribing by ear, writing everything down. So, but what was your story, like finding oh, out? Right. And... Well, I was I was way into Jimi Hendrix. And oh, I was really? oh, wow. Johnny Winter and Alvin Lee. Oh, really? Oh, man. B.B. You know, uh, King. And um, then I got into into the soul music of the day. So I was into James Brown, you know, um, uh, 
Jimmy Nolan, who played with James Brown, and the kind of the you know Catfish and the guys that really played that funk thing. And I, yeah. I liked you know I liked like the Four Tops and the Spinners and the Whispers and you know all those kind of groups. So I listened to all those guitarists that played on those sessions, Bobby Eli, and, um, and there were a bunch of guys that played on those sessions from Philly <laughs> International, and I, I, I got that together pretty well. And uh, but Hendrix was my guy. I was like you know Cry of Love was my album. Oh man, you know, yeah. Bridge. These were my my go-to records, Electric Ladyland, you know, I like, you know, I had the, you know, the the black light and everything in my room and the poster, the neon, but I was like, I was committed, you know, and I was, um, I was walking down the street and I had a, a radio, I thought at that time it was like portable, but it was probably like big, like a lunchbox, you know, but, sure. I, but I'm carrying it and I was maybe 14 at the time and Barney Kessel came. I didn't know it was Barney Kessel, but Barney Kessel came on playing Summertime. Oh, like wow. swinging Summertime. Yeah. And I heard that. I was like, man, that sounds, that's really good. You know, I'd never heard anything like that before. I was like, that's really good. And I, so I went home and I picked up my guitar. I said, well, let me see if I can play Summertime. And I, I couldn't find any of the notes. I couldn't find a feel. I had no idea what was going on. I was like, man, I gotta. So that got me interested in pursuing jazz. Oh, um, okay. and so the first, uh, teacher I ever had was, uh, a teacher named, uh, Alex Pasquale, who was a Haitian guitarist, classical jazz, kind of like a, like a Charlie Bird type mm -hmm. of guitar okay. player, um, who, uh, gave me a few, uh, maybe three or four lessons. He used a book, he taught out of a book by Raymond Ricker that had different patterns and things, which I found horribly boring and I, I, I didn't get it. And he played finger style and I like to use a pick and I didn't get it. I was like, this is, this is not the guy for me. So then, uh, I took a couple lessons from a guy named Al Gaffa. Al Gaffa was a guitarist in New York who was playing with Dizzy Gillespie of all people. Oh man. Okay. And, uh, so he gave me two or three lessons. He showed me like the Dorian mode. And for the first time I heard like, Oh, that, that sounds like, that's not like something I've heard in jazz, like the Dorian mode. I could hear that that sounded like jazz to me. So I wore the Dorian mode out, you know, like I could, I only knew two or three patterns, but I wore those out, you know, <laughs> and, um, it, it, but I still wasn't really satisfied. So then I was in a music store and, uh, there was a guitar player in there. I was trying out a, a jazz guitar and this guy walks in African American guy. He must've been about 25. I was 15. Um, and he says, hey, man, give me that guitar. And I said, okay, you know, and because uh, he was like, he looked very hip and jazz musician. He was dressed the part, you know, I was like, okay. And he, he turned the guitar upside down because he was lefty and he played great. It was, he like played, sound like Wes Montgomery and Grant Green and George Benson. I was like, <laughs> so I asked him, I said, man, do you, I said, what's your name? He said, Bruce Johnson. I said, do you give lessons? He said, yeah. He said, I'm getting ready to do a European tour with a trumpet player named Enrico Rava from Italy. He said, wow. well, when I get back, really? I'll call. He said, when I get back, I'll call you. This was the beginning of the summer. So, you know, I heard nothing, you know, then well, I'm uh, it's September school starts. I'm, I'm back in high school, you know, I get a call one day and he says, Hey man, it's Bruce. I'm like, Bruce, he said, yeah, Bruce Johnson he said, you know, the guitar player, I said, yeah. He said, you still want a lesson? I said, yeah. He said, come over now. I dropped everything, no homework, nothing. I grabbed my guitar, went over to his house. And, uh, that was the beginning of my real education in jazz. Cause he was a master guitar player, like at the level of George Benson yeah. or, or even Wes, he was a genius, a true genius, like a amazing unknown and very eccentric, kind of like Thelonious Monk ish eccentric. Yeah but a real genius. He just wasn't interested in, in the world being hearing him so much. So, um, and then he began to really show me like, here are the chords. These are 13th. These are minor ninth. Here are the, what a two five is, how you connect them. And, and that began my journey into, to jazz guitar. He, he said, if you do what I tell you, you'll get really good. <laughs> and I did what he told me. And three years later, I was playing with Dizzy Gillespie myself. Man. His instruction was so good. And I guess I had a little talent and I, I worked at it and what he said was right. He said, do what I tell you and you'll get really good and you'll be able to play guitar. And I, and that's what happened. But, but the, so he was the one who hooked you with Dizzy basically, or no, 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 he, no, I, um, I, I, I had gone down to the village. Uh, there's a club called the village gate in Gates. New York. Yeah. And I'd gone down there to hear Dizzy 
I was playing. Ah, with, okay. I, was, I got the gig playing with Chico Hamilton at the time. Oh, uh, really? I didn't I know that. That was oh, my wow. first. My set. My first professional gig was playing with Jackie Bayard. Yeah. Wow, man, really? Yeah, that was well, my first. How, how was that like? It was I love him. He, he was genius. And, and oh, then man. my second professional gig was playing with Chico Hamilton. With Arthur Blythe was in the band, and and Steve Toure was in the band, and oh, wow. anyway, it was a great band. And uh, so I had gone down to the Village Gate to to see Dizzy play. I took my girlfriend down there, and we went down to see Dizzy play. And Al Gaffa was the guy that had taught me those years before. Was with Dizzy. Oh yeah, Dizzy. it was him. Yeah, 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 sure. Right. So this is maybe you know four years later. I was eighteen now, and I was fourteen when I met Al, or so, or you know, stuff, something like that. And so he says, hey, Rodney, he said, what's going on? I said, oh, hey, Al, you know, I'm trying to be cool. I'm like, yeah, man, I'm, I'm actually professional now. You know, I'm, I'm playing with Chico Hamilton. He's like, really? He said, man, you must have really been practicing. I said, yeah, I did some work. I've been trying to get it together, you know. And uh, he said, well, what's it like playing with Chico? I said, oh, it's great. I'm learning a lot. It's a lot of fun. We've toured the United States. We've been all over. We made a record, you know. I said, and then I said this to him. I said, you know, playing with Chico was great, but I'd really like to have your gig. You know, and he's like, oh, man, go ahead. Well, three weeks later, Dizzy called me and offered me his gig. Oh, man. For years, he thought like I was like baiting him like I knew and I was, you know, and so I, I had to call him. I said, Al, listen, when I said that, like I was just saying that, like I, I had no idea that that's what was going to happen, you know, and so. You still remember that call? I mean, how, how did that go? When I called him? Yeah, I mean, the, the I Dizzy. Oh yeah, Dizzy. Yeah, well, I, yeah, I was home, and uh, the phone rang, and a voice said, "This is John Burks Gillespie," and that didn't mean anything. It didn't even oh, it didn't sure. resonate rec resonate with me at all. So I was like, "Okay," he's like, "No, no, this is Dizzy Gillespie," and I thought it was one of my friends goofing around, you know. So I was like, <laughs> sure. "Sure," and I'm Napoleon Bonaparte, you know. Let's have a nice conversation. He said, no, no, this is Dizzy. And then I recognized his voice. Yeah. Oh, man. And then, of course, well, you know, now I'm like, you know, what we, What do you say when the guy that invented jazz calls you? I'm like, I'm like, you know, starstruck. I don't know what to say. I can't barely speak, you know. He's like, man, I like the way you play. And, uh, you know, uh, I'd like you to join my band. And oh. so, uh, you know, three weeks later, I did my first gig with him in Omaha, Nebraska. Oh, no man. Person. How was that? Like, how was that like? The, it was great. Really nervous, or like? I mean, I would be like, you know. Um, I was nervous, but remember that you know Bruce Johnson had trained me well, and he'd given me a lot of confidence. You know, he mm -hmm. said like the stuff I'm telling you works, and I saw with Chico it did work. Yeah, sure. You no, know, now what the thing I and this is an important lesson. The thing that I teach all my students it, it was the reason I could even do those gigs, and and it's the most it's one of the most important things any jazz guitar student can know. The reason I did got could be hired by Dizzy and by Chico was not because I was the world's greatest soloist, but because I felt good to play with. Mm, like, yeah. if I'm comping for Dizzy, it felt good for him. If I'm comping with Chico, it felt good for him. And that's a question of the rhythm, rhythmic and time feeling. And Bruce really emphasizes, like, man, you know, if you swing, if you get your time together, if you can play on the beat and behind the beat and in front of the beat and make it exciting and comp really well, then you're going to feel good to play with. And people are going to, while you get your plank, your soloing together, people, you'll be able to play with better and better people because they'll want you in the band because you feel good to play with. Yeah. So that was true. So because I could comp really well and felt good to play with, then that gave me opportunities to play with people then I could learn a lot from. So I can learn a lot from Chico, but he didn't hire me because I was a genius soloist. I played okay, but he hired me because when he was soloing, when he, when he was as part of the rhythm section, it felt good. And Dizzy hired me because he would play Night in Tunisia or Blues. Yeah, and it felt good. Yeah. It yeah. felt good for him to play. No one's going to hire you to play with them if they don't. You don't make them feel good. Sure. So that was an important thing to learn. That, you know that like getting your rhythm and time so that you feel good for someone else to play with is the doorway to playing with better players because they're not going to play with someone that doesn't feel good. They're just not going to do it, and then yeah. you don't ever get to l to listen to them and learn from them because you can't be in that area. You know so. Yeah, uh, that's incredible. Yeah, but you, you so you were twenty three when this happened, or. No, no, I, I joined Dizzy's band. I was just turning 19. 19? Just turning 19. Man. And I think I was 18 when I joined and, and turned 19 shortly after. Wow. Uh, and the, was it with Dizzy also that you went like on a first extensive tour, let's say Europe? And 
how yes. was that how was how was that uh, like for you like it was amazing i i was making two thousand dollars a week at that time which was a fortune that's and yeah that's... you know i was a good looking young jazz musician and there were lots of ladies and uh <laughs> you know we toured italy and the food was off the, the hook yeah, sure. the women were off the hook the music was off the hook i was you know touring side by side with kenny burrell and count basie and you know all these joe henderson and all the people that were my heroes all of a sudden because of dizzy and yeah. they're all around him and the tour you know he's the headline of the tour and all the people are so i got to be around all these amazing players all of a, i was like in i was it was a dream come true wow. i was i had money i had late women i had yeah, music sure. i had food i mean what you know what else was there in life to have it was great you know sure and but you you were in new york then located yes like all, all of that and how was the general i mean you played with chico and yaki and dizzy and, yeah. and uh like how was the general feeling then like we're talking about mid 70s in new york regarding Yeah, this is 76, going 76. up to 76. When I, I joined Chico in 75 and joined oh. Dizzy in the beginning of middle 76. Um, I mean, for me, among my... I was sort of the the trendsetter among my peers because there was nobody that I grew up with that was my age that had done those things. So yeah. they all looked at me like, wow, you made it. You're, like, you're the guy that made it, you know. Um, but I have to, you know, I have to really credit... I mean, I worked hard, I practiced hard, you know, I really did, but I also had masterful guidance, like, you know, Bruce, and Bruce was not a teacher who, like, wrote things out, I don't think he ever wrote anything out for me, you know, or said, like, dude, I don't think he ever showed me a scale and said, play this scale like that, he, there was no discussion of modes, there was no discussion of, but he was a big chord enthusiast, so he was like, if you know these chords and see how they move, you'll understand how the lines move through them. And so he said, the core, understand the harmony is the secret to understanding the, the linear part of jazz. Yeah. You know, and so I, that was my approach. He said, every time you play any chord, immediately in your mind, you should think three other chords it could be. Every yeah. time. And then you'll be able to build a solo that has more variety than just a person who says, oh, it's a B flat seventh. I'm playing on a B flat seven. No, you can see it as an F minor, you know. Yeah. You can see it as some, you know, any number of things. And, and uh, so that really that really helped me so among my peers you know i i just sort of out accelerated them at that time you know they all looked at me like wow and so so when i was home from touring dizzy toured you know pretty much 25 days a month but when i was when, when i was home and would go out to a club or anywhere like people would sort of move aside wait rodney's here and you know, they would sort of like clear the because i guess i was the you know a hot shot i'm playing with dizzy gillespie and i'm making money i my girlfriend was beautiful and i i uh You know, I had a nice guitar and an L5. You know, none of my friends yeah. had L5. Yeah. You know, I had an L5, and I'm, you know, I would and I could play. So I would walk into the place, and it was like it was uh, similar to how I've been in clubs when George Benson walked in. Oh yeah, you I've know, heard I've heard that those stories. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and, and, and I don't care who you are, Mark Whitfield, Russell Malone, you know, wh whoever, Dave Stryker. When George Benson walks in, all of us are children. Like we all like the room, the C parts is like a there's George Benson. It, it was, but I had my own version of that, you know. <laughs> Till, till I was playing with Dizzy and George Benson walked in. Oh, man. When was that? In New York? Or? That, was, that was maybe a year later. Um, I was in L.A. and playing a club called The Parisian Room with Dizzy. And I had bought in L.A. I had gone to a music store and they had a, a red, a cherry red 335-12 string. Really? Oh, man. And I said, wow. I said, this could, you know, this could be really interesting. It's hard to tune everything. I said, but you know what? What the heck? I'm going to take that to Dizzy's gig tonight and see how it works. So I took it to Dizzy's gig and I'm there struggling with this 12 string and it was like hard to play, you know, and, sure. you know, and that's the night George Benson walked in Oh. and George Benson walks in and I'm with this cherry red 12 string and I'm like, oh man, aren't I a loser? I suck. You know, it was terrible, you know? And so I did my best, you know, afterwards, George was very gracious as he always is. He's like, yeah, man, you sound really good. I think George. Man, I'm so embarrassed. I have this 12 guys that said, really, I can, I can, I play pretty good, but not on this. And he was like, no, that sounded good. It was fine, you know. And uh, that that began really, uh, you know, in earnest a, a friendship and a mentorship from George to. Oh, really? Him, you know, yeah. Wow. So this, did, did, I mean, did you guys play together also later or like? Well, we became friends and we played together. And uh, I've been to his house many times. I mean, mm. he's such an, he's such a, uh, uh, His guitar playing is just at another level from yeah, any it's... other 
from any other human being I've ever been around. And I've been around all of my peers, and I've been around all of the greats. You know, I've been around Kenny Burrell and Barney Kessel and, yeah. and Herb Ellis and Tal Farlow and anyone you could name, you know. Um, and his level of guitar playing was just beyond anything. It, it's just So, yes, we played together, but most of the time when I... When I'm around that kind of greatness, I just really want to listen. Yeah, sure. So, and watch. So I, you know, I've I've been to his house many times, and he would just play, and it's like it's literally like watching Art Tatum play the guitar. I mean, he could play so much guitar, and it was so masterful and so amazing, and felt so good, and had the blues in it, but it had this amazing harmony. And yeah. his solo guitar playing is is really his biggest unknown. He he's known yeah. he's done he's done a little bit of it, but his solo guitar playing is, you know. You would not ever be interested in Joe Pass again if you heard George Benson really play the way he plays. Oh man! Imagine, imagine all. Imagine Joe Pass's language and all the stuff Joe could do with George Benson's feeling, yeah, and feeling. rhythm and, and, yeah. Mechan- and technique. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's... so imagine George, Joe Pass with an amazing time, amazing uh, technique, perfectly executed, and all these harmonic things. It's like it's it's unbelievable. Truly, it's it's. Uh, it's like, uh, you know, I'm not exaggerating to say it's like nothing I've ever heard any other guitar player do. All of us, Man. all of us, when it comes to that, I mean, we all have, look, I do what I do. You know, I, I, I play pretty good and, and, uh, and do what I do. But, but that level of guitar mastery, I never, to this day, I've never experienced anything like that from anyone. Wow. We're yeah. all kids. We're all, we're all, we're all children when, it's, when we're around him. Yeah, I mean, I, I transcribed like quite many solos of this and it's always it's just you know yeah beyond he, makes, really. he just makes it look like yeah effortless really you know I, I, and I, you know i can play most of what he can play but i had hair when i started you know <laughs> you know like it was so much so much effort and sexual it was like climbing mount everest he sort of like flew over Mount Everest with wings. He's like, "Hey, Rod, I'm like, oh, I'll be there. I'm getting there. You know, it's like that. You know." Yeah, I yeah. I, that's how I feel. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, when I transcribe that stuff, I, when I used to, I was like, "Man, writing percentage, the speed where I came to, you know, like I transcribed it, and then I was like, okay, sixty percent next month, maybe seventy. <laughs> that stuck there yeah. for a long time, and yeah, even if you write it out, playing it is another matter. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so, yeah, an amazing. But uh, speaking of those times, like of Dizzy, I wanted to ask you, how was he as a band leader? I mean, I, I watched you guys. There's a footage from Hamburg, and it's like, uh, I think it's Dizzy's birthday or something like that. And you you play, it's basically you play a eight minute solo over, and it seems so much fun. But how yeah, was he like I mean, as a band leader? Well, he he let me play as much as I wanted. He never really restricted my how long I could solo, which was a gift. You know, I guess he, yeah. I guess he heard something. And I think also he was like, he could take it easy and I would do all the heavy lifting, you know, in terms of putting out all that kind of energy, you know, yeah. um, he was a very, very nice, uh, you know, kind, kind, but it wasn't, it wasn't, you know, warm and fluffy. It wasn't like, Hey, you know, you know it wasn't like that. Cause it was professional. You know, he, he treated me, the moment I joined his band, he treated me as a professional. The age didn't matter. He treated me like I belonged in his band. And um, and I appreciated that, you know. But he was, you know, clearly he was tolerant of what I didn't know. And he was willing to give me time to learn. He didn't show me a lot. He didn't. He never really said, hey, check this out or do this or do that. He didn't do much of that. But just standing around him night after night, hearing what he's playing, hearing yeah. his playing his tunes with him you know i played a night in tunisia in tunisia at night with him you know uh you know so uh he was able he gave me enough space to grow and learn you know and he overlooked the stuff i didn't have together and you know gave me time to to get better at the stuff i could do so he was really a a, a kind and we became friends we stayed friends all his life Oh, um, I was with him three years, and uh, we stayed friends for the rest of his life. Yeah, yeah it's like this old style tutoring younger players. Apprenticeship, yeah. Apprenticeship, yeah. That's beautiful. Did did he encourage you also to to do uh, articulation then, or no, no? no. Uh, articulation came about because 
Yeah, Bruce Johnson, my teacher, always encouraged me to write too. He said, you know, write vehicles that are the types of songs you want to play on. He said, because otherwise you're going to spend most of your time playing standards and you'll be good at that. Yeah. You'll play your own music and you won't know what to do. And that was really true. You know, if you spend, you know, 10 hours playing Stella by Starlight and all the things sure. you are and like, you know, write your own song and never play it. And then, so he said, no, you got to play your own music too, you know. So I was always writing tunes and working on, particularly on intervallic fourth and fifth sorts of things. And, and, uh, cause I was gravitated towards that, you know, yeah. and, uh, so, but the promoter that used to promote Dizzy Gillespie in, in Europe, particularly in, in Holland and Germany was a guy named Wim Wick, Wim Wicht. Mm -hmm. And, uh, he had a record label called Timeless Records. And so I, I asked him, I said, Hey man, I, I want to do a record for you. And he's like, oh, oh, wow. Okay. He's like, okay. And so I did, I did the record. Actually, that's the second record I had ever done uh, under my own name. The first was a duo record with Bruce Johnson and myself. Oh, really? Called the liberation of the contemporary jazz guitar. If you, is this Google, available somewhere or, uh, it is available. I think it's some somewhere, but okay. if you go on YouTube and Google Rodney Jones, uh, go on YouTube and type in Rodney Jones, Bruce Johnson. I think there's a couple of cuts that will come oh, up. Oh man, I have to check this um, out. But oh. that's the first first recording ever day. It's a just just duo, and you can hear some of Bruce's genius on that too. Oh man, beautiful! Oh, I have to check this out. Super. Well, and how did you decide for the band? Like, well, you, Kenny Kirkland. I mean, Kenny I, introduced Kirkland Kenny, band, you know? I introduced Kenny to jazz. Kenny was a classical piano player. Oh and, man! And we lived in the same neighborhood, so I would see him around, and I would be like, "Hey, Kenny, you know." Why don't you play jazz? He's like, no, nah, man, you're playing jazz. I can't play jazz. I'm like, no, you can learn. You can get together. He said, no, nah, man, I can't play jazz. So one day, you know, maybe six or seven months later, I'm walking by a building. And I hear this amazing jazz piano. It sounds like Oscar Peterson or, or Herbie Hancock or something. I'm like, what is that? And it was so good. I actually, like, waited for someone to come out of the building and went in the building to try to go to the door to <laughs> knock on the door to see who it was, you know? So I, I went in the building. This is the building was 160 Claremont Avenue in New York, and I I went in the building and I went floor by floor, and I got to the fourth floor and I went to this door and I heard the piano. Come. I was like, man, that is like whoever that is. Like my thinking is like I need to get lessons from like whoever this is. Like this is way beyond what I know. I need to get lessons from this guy. I found my teacher, and I knocked on the door and Kenny Kirkland came to the door and I'm like, Kenny, what are you doing here? He's like, oh man, I'm just here playing piano. I was like that was you? He said, yeah. I said, wait a minute. That was you playing that on the piano? I said, how did you get so good? You you didn't play any jazz at all. How did you get so good? He said, Oscar Peterson method book. <laughs> so then Kenny Man. and I began to get together and we would transcribe. He would transcribe Kenny Barron. Like we listened to, we used to like uh, Bad Benson because yeah. Kenny oh, Barron was yeah. on that record. That's and it. I love George Benson. So he would like, transcribe the, the, the Kenny Barron part and I would transcribe the George Benson part and then we would share back and forth and talk about what we loved and all that kind oh, of stuff. Oh man, that's beautiful. But Kenny and I were friends so I called Kenny. I mean, there, he was, you know, there was he was the only choice I would have called. Uh, ben Brown was the bass player on the recording. Uh, Bruce Johnson played bass on one record, I think, on one track, but Ben Brown was the bass player with Dizzy so Ben was my friend. And we okay, so that was the natural. Ben with Denard and I we used to play in funk bands Yeah, as teenagers so that's why I called Kenwood. Um, and, uh, Bimshi Jones, I had married her and she was my wife at that time, my, my girlfriend. And so, yeah. so, uh, she sang on it and, you know, I, I got to keep the wife, happy wife, happy life. And, uh, <laughs> Wallace Roney, I had met because Wallace Roney had been, uh, but he was he like 18, right? Back then yeah, or, something, like, or, or younger. Yeah. Like, I had met wow. him when he was, when he was 15, he was, he, we played it. I played with Dizzy at a high school and he was the opening high school band act. Him and his brother Anton, yeah. And I said to him then, I said, you know, I was just three years older, but to him, I was like with Dizzy, I was like, I said, man, you sound good. I said, but I said, I'm gonna do a record one day, man. I'm gonna call you. And so when I got a chance to do the record, I called him. Man, that's beautiful. And, uh, and uh, Arthur Blythe, of course, I knew from Chico Hamilton. Yeah. You know, we work it. So Arthur was one of my heroes and a genius, a real genius. And, yeah. Oh, amazing. And man. Bob Mincer, I had known from back in the day too. I love Bob because Bob reminded me of like, like sort of like the Coltrane Michael Brecker yeah. he had that yeah. language that I really liked it so I called Bob and Bernadine Davis played flute who I knew from living in my building she was a good flute player and I decided to give her a chance and and did I miss anybody I think that's the whole band yeah, yeah. that's beautiful and did the, was this also like a group that you played with like with Kenny 
I mean, like yeah, a Kenny and I, Kenny and I played together. Yeah, Kenny, Kenny toured with me in Europe. I did a tour with Ronnie Barrage, Kenny Kirkland, and and Ben Brown on bass, and we toured all over Europe uh, in 1979. But 79 already. Wow. In, in the next year, because um, I did that record in 78, so yeah. we recorded. But but I never. I mean, Kenny played in that band, but and Kenny and I worked together a lot when I was home in New York. Yeah. And, uh, but we never really. I never toured with the Articulation Band. Oh. And it caused I did, this I did, I did end up having a band with with Arthur Blythe in it though, with Arthur Blythe and Fred Wesley. Yeah, and, really. Uh, Doc, oh. And Dr. Lonnie Smith. Yeah. And Idris oh, Muhammad on drums. Yeah. Oh, man. And uh we that was the Soul Manifesto tour. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's incredible. I mean but I just wanted to ask you, like this nineteen seventy nine tour, the first time you being as a band leader. Yeah. How, how was how did you feel? Uh, because you've done so many records. And uh, how, but how did this make you feel as a band leader the first time leading a band? I felt ready. I felt really ready because, you know, first of all, I had seen, I'd Dizzy. seen how to, how to yeah. work with an audience because I stood next to Dizzy Gillespie for three years. So I saw like how you do that, you know, I, and I traveled the world with Dizzy seeing how you work an audience and how you speak to them. So I knew how that worked, you know, so I wasn't afraid to do that. I just had to yeah. basically do what he did, you know, in, in, in my own way. And, uh, and here again, Bruce Johnson had given me a lot of confidence early on. And then the fact that I had done so much at that point, I, I had, I was pretty confident because I wasn't cocky, like I'm the greatest or anything like that, but I knew that if I tried to do something and really gave it my all, I could probably do it. Yeah. Bruce told me that he said, if you practice hard, you'll, you'll be able to do it. And I practiced hard and I could do it. I was like, wow, that works. And then with Dizzy, I, you know, with Chico, I tried to learn and get better. And I did I tried to learn and get better with Dizzy. And so, um, you know, I, I, I believed it. I believed I could do it. Yeah. So that was it. And, and also I had my friends in the band, you know, I, all the guys in the band, we were all friends. That's so important. It was, yeah. it was a great hang. You know, we had a fun hang in and the music, you know, with Kenny Kirkland in the band, I mean, he makes everyone sound better. Yeah. Well, he, it, yeah. Everything he plays is brilliant. So, you know, I, I didn't have to worry. All I had to do was show up and <laughs> it was going to be good. Yeah. So, such a band. Yeah. I, I love Kenny. He's like, Every piano piano guy I know, I like you have to listen to this guy. You know, he's such yeah. a, such an underrated player. Uh, but I wanted to ask you this: like you said, you started writing compositions very early, and you know, this kind of leads me to the first record I heard you. There are like all these songs, like Silent Darkness and Mobius, and uh, you know, you ha it's like Silent Darkness has like this Coltrane-ish vibe for me. I don't know the, the entire record almost and has this openness maybe because of the fourths and fifths that you mentioned but like and the bebop lines you know in the heads and but like what's i wanted to ask you what's your progress or what's your process when writing music like is it sometimes like from a chordal point of view or you come up with a melody and then you develop it like yeah well it's evolved and i'll start with present and then i'll go to past so in the present the process is the, and I, I had this realization about 10 years ago, maybe 12 years ago, and it changed my whole playing, it changed my whole writing, everything. It, I think it's the most important realization I ever had about writing music, and I'm going to tell you right now what it mm. is. It's this, that I write what I want to hear, I don't write what I want to say. Okay. So, so okay. I say, if, yeah. I, if I'm yeah. playing this, okay. and I'm in the audience, is that what I, do, is that what, you, what I want to hear it sound like? Versus, oh, I know what I could do next. I know what I could do next. You know, yeah. like me, me, me. What can I do next? What can I do next? Instead of, what would I like to hear next? And so when I begin to write and think like, okay, I'm listening to this. Like, does it sound like what I want it to sound like? My writing changed a little bit. Hmm. Having said that, going back to the early days, I found that for me, there were certain signature key sort of sounds. Like, that, you know, that there were certain movements and progressions that really moved me. That I felt something when I would play a certain aesthetic or a certain way, it really affected me. So then I began to write things. The chords in Silent Darkness are the chords that made me feel like something. I felt those things. So I don't ever write stuff that I could just write it. I write stuff yeah. that I really feel connected to. It's this, like, you know, this kind of thing. If I play, like, uh, you know, I don't know. I, I couldn't play Silent Darkness if you paid me a thousand dollars right now. But, <laughs> but, but the type of chord, like, you know, play a. Yeah. Kind of 
like that. Oliver yeah. Nelson, you know. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Yeah, sort of like keep it. a common tone and, and build build chords around it. So I like this. I like the minor thirteenth type of sound. You know, I like that sound. And my favorite chord is is a minor seven flat five with an actual nine. You know. Yeah, that's a beautiful. Yeah. You know. Yeah, yeah, it's beautiful. You know, so I I would find chords that you know chords that I really like or that gave me it's chills, to you. Yeah. movements, and then I just write songs around them. You know, I guess we build a song around those things. You know. Yeah, that sounds simple. You know, I mean, but that that's a good point. Like, what do you want to hear? I mean, I always when I make an album or I try to make it. You know, if I'm in the audience as well, because because you have to live with it the rest of your life, and every time it's played, you don't want to be like oh. exactly. And it's about the music yeah. in the end, right? It's that yeah. it doesn't have to be a guitar solo every time or. Exactly. You know, I've listened to so many, many, many concerts when it was just like, you know, guitar solo, bass, drum. And at the fourth song, everyone burned it. I mean, but it was just like, yeah, okay, now it's like the fourth time the same thing and it doesn't make sense. So it's. Yeah. And there's also a difference in being, you know, a great instrumentalist and being a great musician. You know, they're different things. True. You can be a great guitar player and not really be a great musician in the same way, you know. And you can also be a great musician and not not be the world's fastest, you know, bestest. Oh, man, so, sure. yeah. you know, it just depends on, on, I just try to strike the balance. I want to be able to play the guitar well and, you know, play well enough to get my ideas out and what I'm hearing and what I'm feeling and what I want to hear. Um, but I don't want to spend all my time trying to, you know, I'll never be George Benson, so why am I chasing that when I'll never be that? Like, you know, it, it's good to, you know, it's good like as a exercise to say like, okay, yeah. You know, like you get on a treadmill and you have someone that can run faster than you and you're always trying to catch up. That builds strength and everything like that. Unless you actually try to say, well, I'm going to be the guy on the treadmill. No, you're never going to be that guy. Yeah, you true. know, each of us, one of us is one Simon, is one me, you know. Yeah, one George yeah. And so, you know, when I realize like, hey, man, the best I can do is to be myself authentically. Yeah. That's like the best I'm going to do. And that then I want to be the best version of myself. And then that's where the excellence and skill comes in you know yeah i agree actually yeah to find find you yourself in a way but uh, re regarding your albums as leader you know you mentioned soul manifesto and then there is the undiscovered few which were done both for blue note right yes uh -huh. and uh, i wanted to ask you like did this those two records did you feel a big change when signing like you know we we're talking about blue note what did this change for you musically or career-wise if if it did like in your own eyes and ears well i mean career-wise if you're on blue note which is the premier yeah record label in the world you know um you know the the, the key with that is is being getting them to hear you and the way how i got to deal with blue note is because i worked with lena horn the singer for years yeah. and she was on blue note and i was her producer and so I produced these tracks and I would solo, you know, I played my solo. So yeah. the vice president who I had sent them recordings trying to get a record deal for, you know, a year before that. Um, then, you know, the vice president is in the studio and we're recording with Lena Horn and I play some solos and I'm, I'm playing, killing it. And I come into the control room and he says, hey man, how come you're not on Blue Note? <laughs> and I'm like, well... <laughs> Not for lack of trying, you know, I've sent like you know, 20 tapes over the past year and no one, no response. He said, well, he said, well, call me next week. We'll see what we can do. Oh, wow, man. And like, you know, three weeks later. It, it happened. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, I felt, you know, it was definitely the, the, the high point in terms of um, jazz career visibility and success because yeah. Blue Note had, had a lot of, you know, reach and exposure and distribution and, the whole machine behind that, the publicity machine. Yeah, that's so important. And the booking machine. And, you know, so there are other doors that are open just because you're on Blue Note that don't open if you're on a small label or, sure. or self-produced. So it was definitely a, a door. The irony of it is I did that record and, and it did it did well. And I did, a, I did a record in between that they rejected. They didn't like it. Oh, really? I did, it was more like an R&B record. And they're like, you need to sort of stay the same like more more undiscovered few 
So I said, well, I'm going to split the difference. If it's not r and I'm going to do like Soul Manifesto, which is like, That's, you know, yeah. soul jazz, you know. And I said, like, you know, then I got my dream band. I said, who, what's the combination of people that have never played together that would be, I said, can you imagine like Arthur Blythe and Maceo Parker playing together? Like with Idris and drums, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, but Arthur and Maceo, like, you know, yeah. Arthur is the avant-garde icon and Maceo, the funk icon together, two alto <laughs> players. How was that hookup, like in the studio? Like, I how mean, did, how did well, that go? well, I'll tell you. When I was in the studio and Arthur was in the studio warming up, doing, like sounding like Coltrane type of things, and and Maceo walked in the studio and he saw me. I said, "Hey, Maceo," and he listened for him and he said, and he looked at me without missing a beat. Said, "You do know how I play, right?" <laughs> you know, and, and oh, I said, man. "Yeah." I said, "No, no, yeah." I said, "I want you to do you. Don't worry about what he's doing. You just come and do <laughs> you. I, I want you to sound like you, you know." And uh, you know, and Idris was, of course, is iconic and you know, legendary from all the Grand Green records and and so yeah. much more. Yeah. And uh, you know, and Ahmad Jamal and every all kind of other things. And um, Lonnie Plaxico is my f- friend for a thousand yeah. years. Uh, love so love him, yeah. Yeah, he plays so so every style well, and. Uh, you know, I, I mean, I played with, with Dr. Lonnie Smith a lot, you know, in New York. And I was like, man, Maceo and Lonnie. Like, it, for me, it was just like, it was, it was totally a kid in a candy store. I'm like, Maceo and Lonnie. Can you imagine Maceo and Lonnie Smith even just hanging out? Can you imagine them in the same room? Like, you know, can you imagine Idris and Maceo? They had never played together. Like, that oh, really? combination. Maceo had never played with Lonnie Smith and didn't really know him. Lonnie had knew who Maceo was, but had never played with him. Idris had never played with Maceo, but Idris had played with Lonnie. Arthur Blythe had never played with any of them. Yeah, <laughs> that's, you know, and neither had Lonnie Plaxico. You know, I had played with. I was the only person that had played with. All, I hadn't played with Idris. I had played with all of them, but Idris. But I knew Idris was playing. You know. Yeah. Sure. So for me, it was like the ultimate science experiment. I was like, if I could get. If I could get this people, these people in the room, and then when I did, when I went on tour with that group, it was Lonnie Smith, Idris, Arthur Blythe, and Fred Wesley. Yeah, from the JB Horns, you know. So yeah, I was sure, like, sure. I was like, man, this is like, this is a dream come true. You know, to hear like Arthur Blythe and Fred play ahead together, and then Arthur solo his way, and Fred, it was like unbelievable. It was a fantasy, basically. It was, it was just me being a, a stupid jazz kid like okay if i could get all these people to play together these are the people i would get it was just my fantasy to do that so that's what it was you know it's yeah wow that's beautiful that, that's yeah if you're on blue note then you can do that i guess yeah I mean, exactly that's, that's beautiful I mean, if you can if you can yeah, i mean it's it's true and sort of not i mean remember i was working with maceo i did yeah, yeah sure. Record, sure. Sure. I know. so maceo I know. and i were yeah. friends he knew me i'd worked with him for years you know and you know i'd work with him and he knew what i was about so when i asked him like you can't get him if you don't if he doesn't want know you. I know. Want to yeah. Play with you, he has the money. You can't really buy him. I mean, I guess if you offered him enough, you could buy him. But, but I didn't have to do that. You know, I I offered him. I mean, he got paid well. I offered him more than anybody else on the date. I think. Um, but he did it because of me. Yeah. yeah you know, sure. and Arthur Blythe did it because of me, and Idris, Idris did it because. It's always knew, jazz, yeah. He knew of me, and Lonnie knew, you know, and Lonnie and Plaxico was a friend of mine. And so, you know, there's no substitute for relationships. This yeah. No one wants to play with someone that doesn't make them feel good when they play. But also, no one wants to be around someone that doesn't make them feel good as a person. Sure. This is why your social skills are important, because you can be the greatest player in the world, but if you turn everybody off and no one wants to be around you, then you're not going to work. No one's going to hire you. No True. one cares. I agree, yeah. It's like... But uh, speaking of Maceo, I, I know you you did like four records, I think, with Maceo, right? Yeah, five or six. Yeah. Oh, even more. Wow, well, sorry. But uh, how did the story with Maceo begin, actually? like, Well, going back to when I said I was into James Brown. I mean, I knew who yeah. Maceo was when I was, you know, 14 or 15 years old. Maceo was, you know, because James would say, Maceo, and Maceo would blow these solos. And I was like, he was God. Yeah. He was God on the saxophone, you know, that to me. And... uh so uh, I was home, uh, and I think it was 19, I don't know when it was, 1988 or 89 or something like that. I was playing with Kenny Burrell and the Jazz Guitar Band at that time. And uh, I got the call, and uh, it was the record producer, Stefan Minor from Minor Music, said, I'm getting ready to do, Maceo's going to do his first jazz record. 
and I'd like to have you on it. You come really highly recommended. I don't know who recommended me, but I came highly recommended by somebody. Mm-hmm. And uh, so I, I said, oh, you know, like, I was like, wow. And then he told me the money. And the money was <laughs> terrible. And I was like, I don't know. I have to, I have to call you tomorrow. <laughs> I said, I, let me, I have to call you tomorrow. I didn't tell him that's why the pause, but you know, when he told me the bread, I was like, I mean, I knew right, you know, I'd played with a lot of people by that point. I knew what what was right, and this was way yeah. not right, you know. So, but it was Maceo and Fred and Pee Wee Ellis and and, uh, and uh, Don Pullen. Oh, and, really? And oh, Bill really? Stewart. And Bill Stewart. Don Pullen was on organ and Bill Stewart. Wow, oh, man. Um, so, I, I, I called my friend, a guy named Eddie Ellis, who was my childhood buddy with, in my, when I played in bands at 14 and 15, we used to play other James Brown tunes. He, we were at the middle school and junior and high school together and he he loved funk and that's all he played you know and i was like man you won't believe this eddie and i you know i got called to do this record date with maceo he's like oh my god maceo he said well are you gonna do it i said well i don't know and he's like are you crazy he said you should pay maceo to record with him <laughs> if he doesn't pay you anything do it i was like you know what you're right what, what am i thinking like i've become so jaded like it's maceo parker i I should do it for free. So I called back the guy the next day. I was like, yeah, I can make it. Yeah, it's all good. I, I can do it. No problem. <laughs> and so there were no rehearsals. I just walked into the studio and uh, there were no charts. Oh, really? Oh, man. Yeah. You know, Maceo was like, you know, do you know James Brown's version of, you know, it's a man's world? I was like, yeah. Say, okay, but well, we're going to do a version called it's Children's World. And we ran it down two or three times and then record it. Use most of the things, I think with one exception, it's all first takes on that recording. Oh, wow. Uh, which, right. you know, you get it because, I mean, the key with something like that is you, if you hire the right people, you know, I knew the jazz language. Yeah. And I knew the funk language. I, I grew up playing Macy, so I knew that aesthetic. And so it was a good match, you know, for me because I, so he hired the right guy because I, I not only did I know it, I wasn't like a jazz guy who, could play funk. I was a jazz guy who loved funk music, you know, yeah. and who understood that Maceo was the Coltrane of funk. I understood that, you know, so I knew who he was and and felt very, like, grateful. I had, a, like, a real empathy for him and how he played, and I loved that music as much as I love Coltrane. I loved that. Yeah, sure. So, so that was a good good call, you know, to have me in the band, you know. Um, the, the thing that happened, I played in the band, you know, on and off about three years in a row, and but gradually, you know, I like a lot more than just funk music. And so what happened is Maceo, we began playing the Roots Revisited music, but the fans really, the fans all over the world really wanted him to do the James Brown funk thing. Yeah, yeah sure. So then he began his thing, 2% jazz, 98% funky stuff. And in fact, the set turned into that. It was like 98% funky and 2% jazz. Well, life which on Planet Groove, right? Yeah, yeah, and I enjoyed yeah, that. I love that. But too. I also, I'm a jazz guy, you know, so... I, if, to not ever get a chance to play on changes, to never get a chance to really stretch out, you know, to always be playing on funky things. Um, I began to, you know, it, it was hard to do that, you know, and yeah. then he also, he also went on tour for like, you know, two months, these long tours, you know, on a bus in Europe. And I was like, you know, That's so cool. yeah. yeah, it was, it was, it was tough. So, and then I had other things too. I, you know, I had other sure. opportunities. So I was doing other, other sorts of things. I was working with Ruth Brown, the singer at the time as well. And, and Kenny Burrell, I was doing his yep. stuff. And I was doing a show called Showtime at the Apollo, which I was the house guitar player for the Apollo for nine years, you know. Really? Oh, wow. Yeah. So I did all of those kind of things and playing with, you know, people like Lauren Hill and other people like that. So, um, so gradually, I just I just couldn't do it anymore. I guess it was just too much going on the road, and yeah. so I, so I would do maybe one or two tours a year, but they got somebody else to do the the bulk of the work, and then gradually I, that just person that person just took over. His name is Bruno Spite. Yeah, yeah great sure. I, I, I saw guitar. that. I saw him in Ljubljana yeah. with Maceo. A great great funky guitar yeah. player, nice guy. He, you know, he crushed that music, and yeah, and uh, so since it was going to be that, and he was the right guy for that, since it was really going to be ninety eight percent funk. Bruno was definitely the right guy for that. I was not. I was the, when it was 50 50, that's me. When it's 98 2, it's somebody else. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but it, it was a killing band, right? With Bill Stewart on drums and Bill Stewart Larry, and, Larry and then Don, Don Pullen got sick. He, he Don Pullen did the first couple tours. Oh, really? And, oh, got, wow. and then he got sick, so then Larry Golding. Larry, yeah. Yeah, incredible. And so Larry and Bill Stewart and myself and Fred 
uh, Wesley, Macy O'Parker, and Pee Wee Ellison. We did wow. a bunch of tours, and we did we've done some reunion shows even afterwards. We did a couple things where Christian McBride played bass. Wow, um, really? And, oh and man! Larry, Larry, Bill Stewart, Christian McBride, myself, and Fred Macy on Pee Wee, and we've done some of those kind of things. Which maybe those recordings will come out sometime. But um, yeah, oh, it's beautiful. <laughs> but you mentioned also Kenny Burrell, and it was you, Kenny, and Bobby Broom, right? Yes. Yeah. And you know, Kenny is also one of my heroes. You know, like I teach Mine too. teach his songs. You know, like it's a prime example of. Yeah, he has the he has the most Beauty. beautiful sound and tone yeah. and yeah 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 and, and Kenny is he, you know he's the the pinnacle of of a skilled intelligent he plays intelligent music he's he's he knows music at a at a real deep level and and you know and and plays like with such a beautiful bluesy feeling uh, I met Kenny Burrell because when I was around when I was fourteen or fifteen too. Um, maybe I was 15, Kenny Burrell was playing a club in New York called The Half Note. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't get in the club, but I wanted to see Kenny Burrell. So I took the subway and just stood outside the club to watch Kenny come in the club. Just to oh, see him. Wow. You know, and, he would, and he would come in and he would wave to me and I'd be like, hi, <laughs> Mr. Burrell. So this was like every night. So like the third night, he came over to me. He said, hey, kid, you, you know, you... What are you doing here? I said, Oh, I just wanted to see you. I, I play. I'm learning oh, jazz guitar. He, he said, Really? You're learning jazz guitar? I said, Yeah. He said, Well, come on in. And he brought me in the club. And he brought me upstairs to the dressing room, and he played for me and asked me to play, and I played for him. And he was. And interestingly enough, and, and I he knew Bruce Johnson. Wow. He knew of Bruce. He he known Bruce somehow, you know. And so he was like, Oh man, you got the best teacher. You got Bruce is the genius. You got the right guy, you know. And uh, so I didn't see Kenny for this. Maybe it's fifteen. The next time I saw Kenny Burrell was on stage in Nice, France, at the Grand, Grand Parade du Jazz, they called it. And George Ween had put together a, a a concert, and it was it was called Dizzy Gillespie Quartet with Kenny Burrell. Oh wow, man! And so I'm on stage. We're ready, and Kenny Burrell walks up and he looks at me. He's like. And I'm like, <laughs> you, you, you know, made it. <laughs> yeah, I had made it. So then I met him then. So then, um, when Kenny Burrell was putting the jazz guitar band, Bobby Broom had been a student of mine. Oh, and, really? I didn't and, know. Yeah, that. And, and, you know, he took right. a couple of lessons, just a couple okay. of lessons. But we had played together. You know, Bobby's parents would, when I would play in New York with Dizzy, I was 19. Bobby was, I guess at that time, if I was 19, I think Bobby was 16, you know, or, or 15. And his parents would bring him, and he would always be in the audience like this. He was trying to play jazz, and he would come backstage, and I'd be like, hey, you know, I'm, I'm like the big man. I'm like, hey, man, you play guitar, you know? I mean, I'm only three years older than him or whatever, but, you know, it might have well have been a thousand years, you know? And um, so I knew Bobby, and I love Bobby's playing. I mean, what a, what yeah, a beautiful what player. great player he is, great feeling and, and, yeah. and all that. So. So it was Kenny Burrell and myself and Bobby Broom and Kenny Washington on drums and yeah. uh, Dave Jackson on bass and we did we did two records for Blue Note and then we did a bunch of touring and uh, but it was great just to stand next to Kenny Burrell every Kenny, night yeah. and stand next to Bobby it was fantastic you know really nice like speaking of Kenny what what, what did you learn I mean like I guess what what didn't I learn what, yeah what, I mean like he was I mean I, I learned or... I learned the importance of touch. You know, I saw, mm. I saw a master, I saw the touch. I mean, there's something just to watching a master at work. It doesn't have to be a specific thing, but just watching someone who's a master do what they do. You know, yeah. I saw the way he held his guitar, the way he took care, you know, the way he tuned it, you know, the, the way he would, you know, his harmonies and the way he would play chords and the solo guitar playing also was like unbelievably beautiful. And, and uh, the way he, he had Bobby and I, the way he conducted us, because he did conduct us, he you know how he blended the sound and what's not known is that during that time i was playing exclusively with my thumb oh really so, oh, yes, wow. i was only i was only using my thumb uh from the years of of uh i guess 80 80 to 85 i only played with thumb and for that tour i with kenny i only, i don't think i used to pick hardly at all i think i used a thumb almost the whole how come because i wanted to i love west montgomery and the warm sound and i i figured if if i was gonna play with my thumb i needed to be good at it and the only way to be good at it is i had to really commit to it i like 
I couldn't half do it. Yeah. Like, you know, like playing with the pick and then sort of like, well, the last five minutes picking, playing with the thumb didn't really work. So, so I spent five years really exploring how to really do it and, and got it together, you know, and, uh, and, you know, and I don't think got together, but I got it more together. And, uh, so with Kenny Burrell, I thought it was interesting. You know, you have Bobby sort of playing like more Schofield Benson thing. And then Kenny, and I said, I'll do more of the West Montgomery as well as some intervallic things, you know? Yeah. And, uh, so yeah, I was, I was, you know, I was doing a, let's see, I don't have my strap on, but. Yeah, that's so beautiful. Yeah. 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 Playing with the thumb, it requires an embouchure. You know, the thumb. Man, yeah, it's heavy. Yeah. Requires a callus, and I don't really have the callus for the thumb right now because I don't play much with the thumb. So, yeah. That's beautiful. Uh, it's so beautiful to hear you play. I you can just play. I'm like, okay, no, beautiful. Well, at the end, at the end, I'll play for you. Uh, you, yeah. can, you can ask me a question. <laughs> yeah, I, I just wanted to also speaking of you know Wes and Benson, we talked about, and I don't know when I think of Benson, I always hear also you know and uh, Wes the idea of a uh, organ trio, and you also worked with Jimmy McGriff and uh, mm. how how you know a lot strong guitar organ tradition like uh how do you how do you see your period with jimmy like how was that like i mean it was, it was a dream come true jimmy was soulful and you know he was not a virtuoso like jimmy smith you yeah. know or even lonnie smith but no one played the blues or <laughs> no one played the blues as, and swung harder than jimmy mcgriff you know so yeah i mean it was great you know i was it was a blue i played with him i was also playing with irene reed at the time too as a blues singer and also Ruth Brown was also a blues singer, so I was really, uh, you know, steeped in the blues. Good, it was great. Good was Jimmy thing. Smith, Jimmy McGriff, and also Hank Crawford was in the band. Yeah, man. And yeah. So you know, I mean, you, you know, I, yeah, blues was in and out of you know. I want barbecue sauce on my cereal. You know, like you know, I was like you know, I was like blued out. You know, I was bluesed out. You know, so um, but it was great. You know, it was fantastic, and he gave me a lot of room to play. And, uh, you know, the key with playing with Jimmy is to play appropriately, you know, because I like to play like out and in and out. But I had to like mm -hmm. remember who I'm playing with, you know, and what I'm doing and what I'm there to do. So I, I, I did that. I loved it. I also played with Jack McDuff, too. And oh, I really? Played a lot of, I, oh, yeah, I did. And I played with Lonnie Smith. And what's not known is I also played with Jimmy Smith. Really? Yeah, I did Jimmy Smith's last gig, which I think I put one of the tracks up on YouTube. But oh man, I have to check this out. Really? I did his last his last performance at the Iridium in New York before he died. Oh um, man. We were, we were supposed to go and do a European tour. Jimmy Smith was the pinnacle of playing with organ for me. I played with all I played with you know all of the great organ players you know, um, really all of them. But Jimmy Smith alone. Because he was the original and the founder, yeah, all the copied West him. connection, and, yeah. yeah, and and also George Benson playing with him too. So yeah, sure. when I stood in that when I stood in that chair, then I then the weight of history was on me because he had recorded with Grant Green, he recorded with Wes, he recorded with George Benson, and what am I doing up there? You know, like what am I doing? <laughs> so it made me realize that that was a moment when I realized, you know, why I, I had sort of accomplished something. I had gotten good yeah. enough. That I deserved to be on the stage with Jimmy Smith and could hold my own. I did a good job. I mean, I, he 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 asked me to be in his band, and he liked what I played, and and it's documented, you know. And um, yeah, I, so that was a moment where I was like, you know, like the first time I played with Lena Horn, I remember thinking like, you arrived somewhere, you know. I arrived with definitely the, yeah. the Blue Note, you know, when I got played with Maceo, I was like, okay, this is. The work you did, the stuff you did, to, you know, the love of the music has brought you to this thing to be with me. So you went from listening to him on a record at 14 to playing with him on the stage. Yeah, that's, that's beautiful. Yeah, that's, yeah. And, I mean, and likewise with Dizzy and, and uh, you know, and, um, but uh, being on stage with Jimmy Smith was a similar sort of feeling. Yeah, I can like, imagine. Wow, yeah. This, this is, you know, it just let me know that I had, you know, that the work I had done had had meant something you know because i mean which i knew anyway but it, just, it was just validation you know because i figured if i'm good enough to stand on stage with jimmy smith 
I've accomplished something. Like, you know, I, it was a moment I could say, okay, I got something together well yeah. enough that I belong on stage with Jimmy Smith. That was a, a really important thing. And this is after playing with everybody else. You know, I mean, I'd done, sure. you know, and I'd done all kind of other, you know, pop gigs and, you know, all kind of other things. But standing on stage with Jimmy Smith was a moment of, of, um, it was just amazing. Personal validation in a way or something. Yeah, I guess personal yeah. validation. I guess you could say that, yeah. Yeah. But the, 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 for me, I mean, it's so amazing how at one stage you were so doing like, you know, your own really modern jazz stuff that's in 95 or even earlier, the, the X-Field. And you played at the same time blues with Jimmy McGriff and, yeah, you know, well, Lena Horn. So amazing. I think, of, I think of it like... I mean, if you think like Coltrane recorded Giant Steps before he played on Kind of Blue. Yeah. Yeah. You know, if you think of like, so I think a lot of us as artists, we're always working on things that are like our private journey or, you know, um, but for me, the key to playing with all the different people that I play with, I play with, you know, you know. I mean, the, I, the people I know, I turned, it, down, I, the list, I turned the list. down George Michael. I turned down Michael Jackson. And I turned no, down really? Whitney Houston. Yeah, I turned down Whitney Houston. I mean, the list of people I've, I turned down Christina Aguilera. The people I've turned down, you wow. know, Michael McDonald, the people I've turned down, you know, are as great as the people I've played with and I've accepted. <laughs> but the point, the point being that, um, I think the key for all these gigs is when I'm playing with someone to know what's appropriate like Lena Horne to know what she needs to hear to make her, to, you know, you have to ha be humble enough to make the music the star and not make it about you. So I'm always thinking like, what's going to make Lena sound the best? You know, what's yeah. going to make Jimmy McGriff sound the best? What's going to make Maceo sound the best? Not like I'm doing me, you know? And I think that's the quality really that's a, of a side man. Yeah. You know, a, a, a super side man. That if you know, if team player. Support, mm -hmm. you have to yeah, you'd be a team player and, and know what's going to make the music good. But the other part of it is because of the time I grew up, I genuinely really liked all those types of music. So none of those were like me having to do it just for money. You know, playing with Lena Horne and backing up a singer was like, yeah. you know, we, you know, you learn jazz guitar, you learn that's part of what the journey is, you know, and, and playing the blues, you know, you got to go through the organ stuff and, you know, and if you're going to play the bebop, you're going through the dizzy thing and you're going to play funk, yeah. you're going to encounter James Brown and, and on and on and on. So, I like that, you know. I like, I like, uh, you know, the m Americana, like the Pat Metheny. I like to play. A... Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I like that. Yeah. I'm not, I'm sure. not doing that like goof on it. I like it, you know. So, um, I think because of the time I I grew up in. I had all these influences and I liked a lot of different types of music. So it let me be so good at playing with a lot. When I'm playing with Maceo, I'm 100% really there trying to do that and feel it. When I'm with McGriff, the same thing. Lena, the same thing. Dizzy, the same thing. Anybody, the same thing, you know. Yeah. And also, I was a student of the music. So, Beautiful. you know, yeah. I knew who Jimmy Smith was. Yeah, you know, yeah, I sure. Knew, That's... I knew the record. So I knew Oregon Grinder Swing and, you know, Chicken Shack. And so I was prepared. You know, with Jimmy McGriff, I knew, job, yeah. I knew the stuff, and Lena Horne, I knew, and so you know, I tried to do my research and homework, and of course, Kenny Burrell. You know, my one of the first albums I ever got was uh, introduced. Uh, it was Kenny Burrell live at the Five Spot. Yeah, and uh, so you know, I knew who they were, and I had reverence for them. You know, I not I knew who they are, and respected them as artists and as as people, um, which yeah. always helps. That's important. Yeah, I just. Just not to take too much of your time, Ronnie, just one last question. I, I saw you, you did this like in Brooklyn in April. There's like on YouTube a whole concert of your quartet with Carl Allen and Loni Plaxico and Dabi Nriu, uh, yes, yes, really yes. young piano player. And uh, is this something new that you're brewing, a new album coming up or a new quartet? Uh, I have or... recorded a couple albums like that already. It, it, none of it has come out yet, um, but... Um... I don't know if it's new or not. I, I, you know, I, I, I mean, I don't know if you knew, like in, in, in 2017, I had, I injured my hand. No, I didn't. My left hand. My, I severed the, the ligament of my index finger 
and the vein in my hand. Oh, I man. couldn't play for about a year. Oh man. Um, so, and my, you know, I, I had to really do extensive therapy and, you know, the doctor told me the best to hope for would be to be able to open a jar or a door, oh. you know, that playing guitar was not, you know, oh, and so I had to decide that I, that, that wasn't going to be true, you know? Um, and so that was like climbing Mount Everest, you know, to come back from that. Um, so what I decided then is that, you know, I, I decided that if, if I could play again, I was going to spend my time playing all the stuff I really wanted to play and not stuff I did that I was going to really do all the stuff. But, you know, you say, oh, I, one day I'm going to do this. or I'd like to work on this or I'd like to do that. I decided that all those I'd like to, I was going to do. Oh, that's beautiful. And so I really then to pursue um, even more so my own uh, way of playing the guitar, my own vocabulary and jazz. And I realized that I could, I saw a path forward of like, some sounds and a way of playing that hadn't been done before that yeah. I haven't heard anyone to date in the world do these things. And they seem natural to me. And it seems like I was, I could do them and I like yeah. to do them. So I began to really pursue that. And, uh, that recording with Carl and, and Dobbin and, and Lonnie is not the greatest because it was cold that day. That was the first time I had played since the pandemic. So I had not yeah. done a gig in, in a year and a half, um, you know, with anybody. And uh, my hands were fried, like walk like I have a mile carrying my guitar. And my hand was frozen, and I literally walked in the studio, and within ten minutes we were recording. So oh, man. that's not my best. I mean, it's okay, but it wasn't my best work. I never played in a mask before, so yeah, the that's... whole thing was really weird and uncomfortable to me, you know. But I did my best, you know. Oh, it's a beautiful um, spirit of the group. I mean, I really love. You yeah, know. I mean, and, and and they played great. And Dobbin, what a what an amazing. She's twenty five yeah. years old. You know? Never, I saw her the first amazing, time. Yeah. What an amazing talent she is. You know. Yeah. I I found her on YouTube. Oh really? You know? Yeah, a friend of because I had a student, a great good guitar player named Sean Britt, who said you know I was talking about piano players. He's like, have you heard Dobbin Rue? I said no. He said, because he she was a student at Manhattan School of Music where I was teaching. You know, and I said no, I haven't heard. Her. I said yeah, well check her out on YouTube. So I went to YouTube and, and typed it in, and there's this like you know, small, petite, you know, South Korean woman sitting at the piano. I'm like, oh, what's this going to be about? And then she crushed it. I was like, oh my god, like, yeah. you know, you want to know if, if you know, you know, if you want to know if jazz is universal, well, there it is. Yeah. Jazz is universal. There's no race. There's no gender. Jazz is truly universal. And I was like, wow, she played great. So when I got a chance to do the, the gigs we've done, or if you, I don't know if you subscribe to. To Smalls to their yeah I, I said yeah yeah it's amazing yeah, so there's How did like you do? three amazing. or four gigs I've done on Smalls and she's on two of them I believe you know okay I'll that's what I did was with organ and drums with my oh, plenty okay. under Kyle Kohler oh yeah my plenty yeah. Yeah. played with Dave for that striker yeah yeah it's beautiful. so yeah so anyway I discovered like you know like I always was interested in like you know yeah it's you know, yeah. I Articulation. Oh, I don't remember. I can't. Remember. I don't remember. But <laughs> whatever it is, it's something like that. Whatever Beautiful. it was. But I always like playing that way because I, because a huge influence. I mean, Bruce Johnson played a lot of intervals, but the main guy that really got me into playing that way was a guitar player named Nathan Page. Mm -hmm. with him? No, I'll write this down. H E N Nathan Page. Hmm. He played with Jimmy Smith some, but the recording he did a record, and you can it's on YouTube. He did a recording with the organist Doug Carn. Yeah, I know. And, yep. Yeah, he did with and he did a recording uh, Doug Carn. The recording is called Feel Free. Okay, I'll write so, this down. It's on YouTube. You'll see it. It's on YouTube called Feel Free, and he played like a three minute solo that changed my life. When I heard that solo, I I said out loud. That's how I want to play. Oh, okay, definitely. Like, more, more than Wes, more than George Benson, more than anybody. I heard this solo. I was like, "That is me." I heard that. I was like, "That's that's how I'm supposed to sound." And uh, so then I, I, you know, began to to really. Connect. But I always had that tendency to connect that way. So what I was going to play for you, what I was going to show you, let me. I'll turn on my other microphone here, and you'll see. Oh, please. Uh, let's see. Thank you. 
Mics is now turned off when you were talking. So I I spend my time, you know, um, really pursuing that way of playing because that's how I really like to play now. Yeah. You know, and, and I play, you know, when I play Beautiful. things like, you know, even like. Uh, <laughs>
like the, the history of jazz guitar in three minutes. <laughs> yeah, really. You, you, you. Oh, beautiful, beautiful. But you know that that Thank is you so uh, that's the you know if you love what you do, then you never work a day in your life. You know because True. every time every time you're doing music, I mean, and it's a privilege. You get to teach it music, is. play music. Yeah. I mean, there are people that are digging ditches and and you know moving, oh, you know, moving rocks. For, you know, they get up and that's what they have to do. We get to pick up a guitar yeah, or, it is or a help privilege. them don't realize their dreams. It's a, it's a gift, you know. It's so a privilege. I don't think yeah. Yeah. Cool. I so hope you got what you needed. Matt, thank you so, so much. Really. <laughs>